A 31-year-old Sunderland man was arraigned in Bennington Superior Court Thursday on a first-degree murder charge in the death of Helen Jones, an elderly Arlington resident. The homicide took place shortly after New Year's Day and left the community stunned and shaken. Timothy J. Butler was charged both on one count of first-degree murder and a second charge of burglary into an occupied dwelling with a deadly weapon. If convicted on the murder charge, he faces life imprisonment. The burglary charge could lead to 30 years in jail plus a $10,000 fine. Butler pled not guilty to both charges. Butler was taken into custody around 3 p.m. on Wednesday at the Arlington Rec Park and is being held without bail at the Marble Valley Correctional Facility in Rutland. Butler appeared in court Thursday to hear the charges against him and was returned to custody after a brief court hearing where state's attorney Erica Marthage presented the charges to the presiding judge, William Cohen. Butler was represented by attorney Frederick Bragdon. Butler is accused of entering Jones's home on Buck Hill Road in Arlington on January 2nd and causing her death by multiple stabbing wounds, according to court documents. Jones lived alone and the homicide was not discovered for possibly two days when one of her daughters asked a neighbor to go over to her house to check on her. Butler had been employed by Jones to mow her lawn about 15 years ago, according to a statement in the court affidavit, and had also been at Jones's residence a few weeks before the alleged homicide to inquire if she needed any tree work done. The court affidavit also stated that an anonymous tip received by the state police on February 26th led them to focus on Butler, who they first interviewed on January 6th. State police began intensive surveillance of Butler, which included a monitoring audio recordings made by an informant who was equipped with a recording device. In one of the recordings, Butler allegedly admitted to doing the crime. A weight of evidence hearing was scheduled to be held in a few weeks. After the arraignment, State's Attorney Marthage and Major Glenn Hall of the Vermont State Police held a press conference which described the events leading to Butler's arrest. We'll leave you now with the full 20 minutes of that press conference. So, uh, my name is Erica Marthage. I'm the Bennington County State's Attorney. Uh, first and foremost today, I wanted to express my sincerest condolences to the family and friends of Helen Jones for their tragic loss. After an exhaustive investigation that has taken more than two months, the Vermont State Police were able to make an arrest. I want to thank the dedicated and tireless work of the Vermont State Police. As I stated back in January at a community meeting, VSP has committed significant resources and personnel to their investigation. It has remained a priority for all of the officers involved despite the passage of time and multiple other demands on their commitments. As you know, my staff has also worked diligently on this over the last two months and we were able to file a two count information earlier today, uh, today charging first degree murder and burglary for the stabbing death of Helen Jones this information charges uh, and charges carry a penalty of 35 years to life if convicted. We uh, wanted to hold this brief uh, press conference just so that we could answer questions the press may have as a group uh, rather than trying to address everyone individually. I believe Major Hall with the Vermont State Police has a few words as well. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Major Glenn Hall. I run the Criminal Division for the Vermont State Police. Um, I would echo uh, State's Attorney Martha's comments that we offer our sincere condolences to the family of Helen Jones. Uh, we are hopeful that uh, this arrest is a first step uh, towards providing them with answers and uh, towards providing them with some closure. Uh, I would also uh, acknowledge that uh, this crime had a huge impact on the Arlington community as well as uh, across the state. And we certainly hope that uh, we can put some minds at ease uh, with an arrest in this case. Um, this investigation is not over, and this is a step uh, where we have uh, made an arrest and uh, have a person in custody, as Erica mentioned. Um, I know that you just received the affidavit, um, but I, I just want to I want to recognize uh, the detectives that have worked tirelessly on this case back in January. I said that this was a number one priority for the Vermont State Police. It has been and continues to be a top priority. Um, our detectives have worked tirelessly on this case uh, since it happened, and uh, I think this is an example of how difficult these cases can be. We have a, a woman who was killed inside her home and no apparent witnesses, and the crime's not reported right away. So as you can imagine, this is uh, a difficult investigation that needs to be taken step by step. 
Uh, we need to rule out potential suspects and identify uh, suspects that may be involved. So it's a long process. Um, we would obviously like to uh, bring closure to this quicker than we did, but uh, again, these are not easy investigations to conduct. So um, I'm happy to take questions. Um, I know, again, I know you just got the affidavit. Are there any other suspects? No. Are the suspects involved with uh, possible drugs and was he in this involved in drugs? Or was it an aspect of it with drugs? Uh, that's not something, again, uh, I'll just say again that the investigation is ongoing, but at this point in time, uh, uh, we're not in a position to say that drugs were involved. Any idea on the motive? Uh, that, again, is under investigation. Um, as you can see, the uh, suspect was charged with a burglary, um, and I, uh, we have released information uh, initially that there was forced entry into the, house, into the home. Um, hence the burglary charge, uh, in addition to a first degree homicide. Was anything taken from the home? If so, what can you say what? Yeah, at this time there, there's no information about anything being taken from the home. The affidavit, uh, again, is lengthy and I understand everyone just received it, but uh, the affidavit contains a, really all of the information that is public at this point about both the investigation, the suspect, and the actual crime. Can you say what led you to Mr. Butler? So what I can tell you is that uh, Timothy Butler was interviewed early on in this investigation, as you'll see in the affidavit. Um, we received some information uh, shortly after this investigation began. He was interviewed by detectives initially. Um, we had information that he may have uh, done some work involving uh, uh, tree service, type work at Helen Jones' house um, in the past, um, which was one reason uh, there was a connection there. So he was interviewed early on. Uh, he was not ruled out as a suspect at that time. Uh, in the past week or so, we received additional information from an acquaintance of Mr. Butler that uh, he had talked about uh, being involved in this homicide. So the investigation uh, focused uh, on him at that time, and for the past week, we have been able to obtain uh, recorded conversations with a person who cooperated with the police and Mr. Butler. Uh, during those conversations, there were statements made um, by him uh, that indicated he was involved in this, in this crime. Can you say that if uh, Mr. Butler has a criminal past? He does have a uh, criminal history. He is a convicted felon. He has one felony conviction, and he has uh, several misdemeanor convictions. What is the felony conviction, do you know? I believe it's impeding a public officer is the exact charge. Uh, he had a 2004 conviction um, for taking a, a gun and was involved with suicide. Is there any reopening of that case having, having to do with this? Uh, not at this time. No. Uh, a short time after the Jones death, there was a, a hazmat crew in Arlington close by. Um, was there any connection between that case and this at the time? The officers couldn't talk about it because it was an active investigation. At the time, that was part of the investigation into uh, some of the leads we were following up that Major Hall just mentioned. But ultimately, that has nothing to do with this offense. Will there be any more arrests? Uh, not that we're prepared to talk about right now. Can you talk about the role of DNA in this uh, investigation? Uh, this DNA is something that in this day and age is always something we look at. But again, as we discussed back in January, it is also something that takes uh, a period of time to get. The Vermont State Police has uh, both has not only their lab, the FBI lab, but also private contracted labs that have all been engaged uh, to look at DNA evidence, but the, res the final results of all of those tests are not in yet. I know you can't talk about, um, I guess you were saying drugs, but can you say if Mr. Butler was, was using drugs at the time of this, or is that a question you can answer? 
I'm not comfortable. There's no information in the affidavit that addresses that, and I, you know, anything other than that would be speculation. Can you uh, speak to the relief of law enforcement to finally, after a while now, finally make an arrest in this case? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think I speak for all of us when I say I'm extremely relieved. I know the family is very relieved. Um, this was a very difficult case. We held public uh, a public informational meeting in January to update the public. It's a small community. This is a small county. We uh, all took this extremely seriously, but also to heart. It was something that was uh, at the forefront of our work for the last two months. So um, I, I'm very pleased that we were able to make an arrest, and you've been very patient back there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you speak to the apprehension of Mr. Butler? Um, he was arrested at the uh, Arlington Red Park off 7A. Was, had, he been, um, had he been evading police, or was simply did he find him? He happened to know he would be there, found yeah. him there? Yeah, we can't comment on that. But the, the information about his uh, ultimate arrest is what we can share is in the affidavit. Was he employed at the time? Uh, I, I don't have any information about that one way or another. How concerned was the public and how many tips did you get? I would they were very concerned. <laughs> the number of tips. Yeah, I think uh, I don't have an exact number, but we received, like we do in, in these cases, uh, numerous tips and leads that we follow up. And, and again, I mentioned uh, many, many interviews of people, and it's really about, uh, you know, in a case like this uh, where we don't have a suspect right away. Um, everyone's a suspect that potentially may have been in contact with her or uh, been in that area. So it's a matter of doing interviews, ruling people out, uh, establishing alibis um, and, and connections. And uh, so a lot, of, a lot of work. And certainly in these cases, uh, to your point, that uh, this is not a case that we want to see go unsolved. We realize that uh, there's a lot of uneasy, uh, uneasy feelings in a, in a community when something like this happens, as you can imagine. And I think this even goes beyond the Arlington community uh, to Benedict County and even further than that across Vermont. Um, so we certainly, uh, again, this was uh, a priority. We had detectives they are very dedicated and they don't give up. So um, this is a matter of just keep plugging away until we could uh, uh, get the right information to uh, lead us to someone. He looked pretty roughed up in his mugshot. Was there any resisting of arrest at all? Uh, I'm not going to comment on that. So what's the next step now? What happens now? So at this point it will be set, uh, as you heard in the courtroom, the um, attorneys are asking, we ask that he be held without bail. So that entitles him to a hearing. Um, and that it sounds like that hearing will be set no sooner than three weeks from today. But there's no set date at this time? No set date. The court will set that, and at a weight of the evidence hearing, the court looks at the nature of the offenses, the weight of the evidence, and whether uh, any condition or combination of conditions can keep both keep the public safe and assure his appearance at future court hearings. Um, uh, on the tip, that I just wanted to reiterate that we, we talked about this in January, and I've had, uh, I, I've been doing this since 2000, and the, I have not seen a case where the tip line, in my county, where the tip line was so valuable just in the number of calls and um, the information that was provided. We talked about this in January, how important it was. If you see something, say something. If you hear something, just pass it along so that we can follow up on every piece of information and ultimately uh, that information is screened for whether it's something we need to further investigate. So, so those tips help? The, the high volume, does that make the investigation harder? It, uh, well, I don't think it does, but I'm not the one answering the phone. But they, uh, I, I certainly believe that receiving all of that information and, and then even beyond that, having a team of investigators <laughs> Uh, which I'm sure if you all noticed there were a number of investigators and suits that were in the courtroom and they're all still here. They, they worked on those tips, every single one of them, and they were able to be, it's the same set of eyes, it's the same group of people that are vetting those tips and that information and really information sharing is, is how these kinds of cases advance. And so I believe in this case, more than any that I've seen, the, the number of detectives that were dedicating full days, and I, 
I was somewhat concerned early on that if another major crime happened in another part of the state that we would lose the focus in our case and that was not what happened. There, there has been a focus and it has been maintained over a period of a couple of months and I truly believe that that focus and that dedication is what advances any case, but particularly this one. If the, um, if the family um, does not want to answer any of our questions or anything, that's fine, but I just didn't know if they had a, a brief statement that they would like to say anything at this time. They do not uh, have a brief statement at this point. I believe um, they've answered a couple of questions. Uh, Were their family members here today? Yes. How strong is your case? Are, are you I can't say that. <laughs> describe I'm smiling. The, you describe the team, the law enforcement team that was dedicated to this. Uh, I know you had described it in the uh, meeting in January. Yeah, and I think this uh, uh, it varies, but early on and during the initial investigation, we had uh, a, a large number of detectives. But uh, you're talking about a crime scene search detectives that were at the scene, as you know, for a couple of days, in addition to uh, a investigative team of, I would estimate, at least 20 detectives at any given time in the initial week uh, following this. And, uh, you know, our major, major crime unit uh, is leading the investigation, but this involves detectives uh, in other specialized units as needed. So we talk about our intelligence center or our narcotics unit or um, you know, our general BCI detectives, um, those are all resources that we have at our disposal that are utilized. So um, I'm not sure I can answer your question well, as to the exact number, the but. Scope of it, I was, yeah, so. It's pretty big. So, so the night I arrived at the barracks, there were 40 uh, law enforcement, and that didn't include the crime scene team that hadn't arrived yet. So I certainly was. Uh, say surprise but I hadn't been on a scene in quite a few years that had that number of uh, law enforcement folks present and engaged. So. Is it safe to say that Mr. Butler confessed to this crime over those reported phone calls that you had mentioned earlier? Yeah I'm not going to talk about any confession. Is there any indication that Mr. Butler is connected to the other burglaries that were reported in the Sunderland and Arlington area? Yeah, we, we're still under, there are a number of things still being investigated. What is the normal procedure for the state police when there are break-ins in that close of an area in that short of a time for notifying people in the press? You, you mean as burglaries come in? Yes. We would normally, in normal circumstances, a uh, press release would be done shortly after a burglary was reported. Uh, we did have, uh, I can speak of at least three burglaries that were within uh, three quarters of a mile of uh, Helen Jones's house um, in that time frame. And we are looking at uh, possible connection to those burglaries um, uh, with, with Mr. Butler. Was his name uh, heard a few times during these? I mean, you get a lot of tips. Was his name brought up a few times or was it just uh, one, or, one or two? Or was he, you know, his name mentioned quite a few? I know that his name uh, was mentioned within a couple of days after the start of this investigation. Um, as to exactly how many times, I don't have that answer for you, but that'll certainly be a part of the investigation. And I know there's some details in the affidavit itself about our contact with him prior to uh, yesterday. And you said no that time. exact amount of still under investigation, no information as to what he was going in for? No. There's a no contact order that was mentioned in court with regards to the informant in the affidavit. Uh, was there um, any reason to believe that there was a threat to the um, to the person, or was this standard operating procedure? Could you clarify that? For me, it was. Um, they, I'm not looking at TT as an informant um, as much as an acquaintance that I just uh, didn't feel the need to have her identity out uh, immediately. But um, she, that is standard for us for. Um, numerous witnesses or individuals. Okay. So there isn't specific reason to believe that there's a, a, right. a, a danger. No. Right. Right. no contact was related to the defendant or family or something like that? The no contact order was as to the defendant cannot have any no. contact at all with the family or TT. Um, after this happened, there was an increased presence from the Vermont State Police in the Arlington area. 
do, do you know what the plan is now? Is, is that going to, uh, is that stopped now, or is it going to stop over time? Or, I mean, Arlington is a relatively small area in, in, in Bedroom County. Yeah, I, I would say that, uh, you know, I would leave that to the local commanders, uh, Shaftesbury Barracks Commander and the, and the Troop Commander that covers this area. And uh, those are obviously discussions they will have, but, you know, certainly we, you know, th those local commanders are listening to the community and listening to their concerns and making decisions regarding resources and manpower based on those concerns. So um, I'm sure that they will have those conversations and, and make those decisions. And, and, the, and I know that the Beddington County Sheriff uh, Department, Chad Schmidt and his crew have had multiple contacts with the community and made arrangements for increased presence in certain areas of Arlington, the school and whatnot. So I'm not sure what his plan would be for going forward. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. For the GNA TV News Project, I'm Andrew McKeever.